It is now my great pleasure to introduce Karen Armstrong, one of the world's most thought-provoking, prolific, and original public thinkers on the role of religion in historical and in contemporary life. She is an international authority on religious fundamentalism and monotheism, a leading voice in promoting the core elements of religious traditions that encourage mutual justice and respect. Her poignant writing and captivating talks have sparked worldwide debate and respectful dialogue. Through best-selling books such as 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, The Case for God, and A History of God, she examines the deep differences and profound similarities among a richly diverse array of religious cultures and belief systems. In 2008, she was awarded the TED Prize. In recognition of her call, as well as in support of that effort, for a council of religious and spiritual leaders to draw up a charter for compassion. The resulting charter applies shared moral priorities to foster greater global understanding, and it has grown to a considerable international following. A network of compassionate cities is now emerging to endorse and to implement the charter practically and creatively. As a speaker and writer, she reminds us eloquently that all major religions embrace the core principle of what is understood in some as the golden rule, which requires individuals to treat others as they themselves wish to be treated. Tonight we celebrate her innovative contributions to tolerance, understanding, and compassion globally. Karen Armstrong. Thank you, Vancouver. Um, thank you, um, Robert. Thank you, Alastair. And thank you, Professor Mark Winston, who's been working on these 12 days for such a long time. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be with you here. Right, now, the lecture. <laughs> uh, what is religion? Now, I bet you think you know the answer to that. We all know what religion is when we see it. Um, but actually, uh, it's not as simple as you might think. It's now uh, generally admitted in re religious studies uh, that there is no answer to this question. Our view of religion in the West, in the modern West, which sees religion as a separate autonomous activity uh, that uh, sealed off from such matters as politics um, and ordinary life, something that is an internal quest an internal search for the transcendent and that doesn't mingle much with uh, secular matters. Uh, this is a modern concept developed in the West in the 17th century at the start of our modernity. It's the charter myth of the nation state, the secular nation state. Um, but in other cultures, there is no equivalent to that w the concept of religion. Um, and so I just open with that, and I hope I'll close with some thoughts that link back to that to remind us that we don't always know what we're talking about when we speak and pontificate about religion. Um, because our thinking, despite our um, extraordinary technological and scientific genius, our thinking about religion is often rather childish. Um, indeed, sometimes primitive. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, when I was a, quite a small child, 
I had to learn the uh, catechism defini definition in the Roman Catholic catechism. Uh, what is God? A small question uh, and um, a, a short answer. Uh, one drew breath and replied, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I must say that at eight years old, that didn't mean much to me. And I still find it a somewhat arid, uh, boring definition. But I have since decided that it's also incorrect. Uh, because after, you know, over 20 years now of studying the world religions, um, I can imagine the great luminaries of the past, Maimonides in the Jewish tradition, Ibn Sina in the Islamic tradition, uh, Thomas Aquinas in the Christian tradition, turning in their graves. All of them insisted that God is not the supreme spirit. God is not the supreme being. God is not a being at all. God is being itself. Essay say ipsum, said Thomas Aquinas. It's wrong, said Maimonides, even to think that God exists because our notion of existence is far too limited to apply to God. When we're talking about God, we're talking about a different uh, mode of reality. But what's really, so what's really wrong with that definition is that it takes it for granted that it's possible simply to draw breath and define a word uh, whose literal meaning is to set limits upon a reality that has to go beyond everything we can think and know. And in the pre-modern world, good theology was meant to tip you into a moment of transcendence and silence where you realized that you'd gone beyond the reach of words and concepts. Because our minds are tuned to transcendence. It's a peculiar quality of the human mind that we have ideas and experiences that we can't easily put into words. Uh, and we seek out moments which give us, uh, the, uh, so we seek out activities that give us such moments. Uh, the um, medievals had a, a, a word for that place in the brain, in, in the mind, where we tip over into transcendence. They call it intellectus, uh, our intellect. And we have made our intellect something much more rational and down to earth. But way back in the 10th century, before the common era, the people of India, who were always in the van of uh, religious progress, developed a form of um, religious discourse which would remain normative and would be repeated in different ways in all the great world traditions. It was called the Brahmogya competition. Um, the object of, the, of this was to define the Brahman to find a verbal formula to encapsulate the Brahman, who is the, which is which, I should say, not who, is the ultimate reality in the Hindu tradition. Brahman is not a person, not a personal god. You can't speak to Brahman. Um, and a way of translating Brahman is the all. So you can't possibly define Brahman because Brahman is everything that is. Uh, it is being itself. Um, and it's no good really speaking to, to Brahman because Brahman is also in you. You are Brahman as well as everything else that we see around us. But nevertheless, this was the exercise these priests was, would set themselves. And the challenger would start off, kick off, uh, by using all his great spirituality and intellect and learning uh, with a, an enigmatic, riddling, paradoxical, poetic formulation of Brahman. And the others would listen intently and drawing on their great erudition and their great spirituality, they too would try to respond to that and build upon it, answer it in some way. But the priest who won was the priest who reduced everybody to silence. 
And in that silence, the Brahman was present. The Brahman was not present in the wordy definitions and formulations. The Brahman was known in the stunning realization of the limitations of speech and the limitations of thought. Now, you might say, well, that's all right for the people of India, uh, but we monotheists in the Western tradition believe in revelation. Uh, words and scriptures have come down from on high, have been revealed, cast in stone, and there are things that we actually know about God that have been revealed by God. Well, no, it isn't that simple. Um, because the, um, the idea of revelation uh, origin, had, had meant something rather different. Um, revelation was not fixed once for all. Um, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, the early rabbis created a form of uh, interpretation of scripture, which they called midrash. It comes from the word darash, to go, to go in search of, to investigate, to investigate something that is not immediately self-evident. Um, and you, each time that a rabbi, duly prepared, exposed himself to the sacred text, it would mean something different. Um, and his... Midrash was not complete until he'd found something in the text, new, something new, different, something that would probably never have occurred to the biblical author, but which he could answer the specific needs of the community because revelation was ongoing. It uh, continued every time a... Um, a a Jew opened himself to that text because God's word is infinite and could not be tied down to a single interpretation. I mean, in the, in the, in the Christian uh, world, uh, you have the Greek fathers of the church, such as St. Athanasius, saying, if we're speaking about revelation, it tells us that we know nothing about God. We can know nothing about God at all. That's why things have to be revealed. Um, and a lot of the early doctrines of the church, uh, that, that, like such as Trinity, which I may come back to later, or Incarnation, uh, were devised precisely to tell Christians that they couldn't think about God as a simple personality. And that uh, re the revelation of God uh, in Jesus Christ, the man, uh, meant, says Sir Thomas Aquinas, that... Uh, we don't know even Jesus, never mind God. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was thinking of the verse in the Acts of the Apostles when Jesus ascends to heaven and it says that a cloud covered him. From now on, Jesus has gone for, from us in a way, says Thomas Aquinas. And we are left not knowing. Uh, there's a very famous English, 14th century English text uh, the, called the cloud of unknowing, in which um, the uh, master is teaching the novice a way of prayer. And he says to, me, to him, well, now you're going to ask me, he says to the novice, what is God? And I am going to tell you that I haven't the faintest idea. And that is, uh, we, are, we find it difficult to accept unknowing in our world. Uh, we like, if you say, uh, uh, do you believe in God or, or do you believe it or not, we like to have something definite. If we, someone asks us a question, we don't know the answer, we'll say, I'll look it up. Um, I, I, there's no question in our minds that there is an answer. Uh, the, before the modern era, they were a little more humble. And there's no question of... Um, uh, revelation, sealing things off, and stopping people thinking. The person who invented this Jewish midrash, the great Rabbi Akiva, who died in the early years, earliest years of the second century, um, he um, developed this uh, 
inventive form of Midrash. And there was a story about him in the Talmud. It said that the fame of his uh, profound learning and brilliance reached heaven, and Moses heard about it. And he was intrigued, so he thought he'd come down and find out what was going on. So he came down from heaven and joined Rabbi Akiva's um, uh, Torah class, sitting in the eighth row behind all the other students, and found to his intense embarrassment that he couldn't understand a word of the revelation that was being, had been revealed to him on Mount Sinai. And he goes back to heaven shaking his head, saying, uh, why, did God, did you choose me to be the bearer of revelation when I don't have a, a moment, uh, a, 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 mini, a minuscule part of that intellect? Uh, another rabbi put this uh, more succinctly. He said, that which was not revealed to Moses was re revealed to Rabbi Akiva and his generation. <laughs> so, Revelation is continuous. It's not sealed off once and for all. And there's no question of anybody telling you what not to think. There's a wonderful story in the Talmud which I think should be inscribed over every uh, seminary and over the doors of every department of religious studies. Um, it, one day, uh, the great Rabbi Eliezer was having an argument in the House of Studies with two of his colleagues. Um, about an abstruse point of law in the scripture. And he couldn't bring them round to his way of thinking. Um, so he asked God, would God mind performing some miracles in order to prove that he was right? And sure enough, um, a canal started flowing uphill um, against the laws of nature. Um, a carob tree moved two or 300 yards of its own accord to the left and the walls of the House of Studies caved in as if they were about to collapse. The other rabbis were just not impressed. Um, they, uh, in fact, Rabbi Joshua uh, was rather disapproving of these divine pyrotechnics. Uh, he spoke severely to the walls and said, it is not proper to collapse when the sages are inside discussing serious matters. <laughs> Finally, in desperation, Rabbi Eliezer asked for a voice from heaven to adjudicate. And obligingly, a voice boomed down, why are you quarreling with Rabbi Eliezer? The halakha, the, 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 the law, is exactly as he says. And Rabbi Joshua says, no. And he then quotes back to God his own scripture. Out of context, meaning something quite different, it is not in heaven from Deuteronomy. And the gloss tells us that on Mount Sinai, uh, the law came down from heaven to earth. It is not the business of heaven anymore. And therefore, we do take no notice of a heavenly voice. <laughs> not, even a, not even God can tell a Jew what to think. <laughs> and this is admirable. I mean, we may laugh, but we have lost that confidence. Uh, and we cling in a servile way to uh, things that we've been told or to literal interpretations of scripture instead of launching out into the unknown. Now, one of the things that we found very difficult and has made religion very difficult for us is that we've, we no longer understand the distinction between mythos, myth, and logos, reason. In the ancient world, in the pre-modern world indeed, in most cultures, it was well established that there were two ways of knowing things. One was mythos, one was logos. Now logos we're all very familiar with. Uh, logos is what we use when we're doing science or mathematics or medicine. Um, and when we're trying to um, uh, organize our societies or uh, plan a battle. We need logos, to, uh, the, our thoughts to respond absolutely accurately to events in the, uh, and facts of the outside world. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. But mythos is quite different. Myth, uh, in modern parlance, 
um, often has become so debased in the modern period uh, that it's just thought to be something that isn't true. If a politician is accused of a peccadillo in his past life, he is liable to say, oh, well, it's a myth. Yeah, that's, it, it didn't happen. But that's not how people understood myth in the ancient world. Um, myth, mythos, described or tried to articulate all those elements in life for which there were no easy answers. Uh, those, those puzzling, uh, disturbing things that we cannot pin down, the things that cause us grief. Uh, we need both of them. If your child dies, or you witness a terrible natural disaster, yes, certainly you want logos. You want to find out what exactly happened um, and uh, why it happened. Um, but you also perhaps want to sit quietly, perhaps to watch a sunset, perhaps to listen to some music, to sit quietly holding the hand of a friend in silence, dealing uh, with the turbulence and grief and rage that you are experiencing. And this was the task of myth. Myth has been very aptly described as an early form of psychology. Um, all those stories uh, in, the, in, the, in the ancient myths about gods or heroes going down into the underworld, uh, threading their way through labyrinths, fighting demons, um, were not describing historical events. Um, what they were doing was telling, explaining how we uh, negotiated the complex labyrinthine world of our own psyche. And it's noticeable that when Freud and Jung uh, charted the modern scientific search for the soul, how easily they turned to the old myths, finding them very germane. Think of the myth of Oedipus, the myth of Narcissus. Um, and um, so myth has been well described as a something that in some sense happened once, but which also happens all the time. And many of our biblical stories and uh, do religious doctrines are myths in this sense. That doesn't mean they're less than truth, they're more than history. They're telling you what these things could have meant uh, and how they mean something in a timeless way. Thus, the story, for example, of the crossing of the Sea of Reeds, sometimes called the Red Sea, uh, in uh, the book of Exodus. And I think, you know, uh, the Israelites are escaping, the waters open, they go through, Pharaoh and his army come after them and they're all drowned. Now, um, this has been, people have been in our literalistic uh, modern world, modern uh, people have said, well, you know, the, this is due, uh, an account of flash flooding, which is very common in the region. The, and it's noble, and, uh, but this is missing the point, because this story, whatever happened, we have no idea, uh, is described precisely as a myth. Uh, the Middle East, ancient Middle East was filled with the story of gods splitting seas in half to create the world. Um, the, 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 you have it in the Babylonian great creation myth. Uh, it was part of the common mythology. Uh, but this time, what is being split in two uh, is a sea, but what is coming out of it is not a cosmos, not, not a world, not a universe, but a people. A people is being born. And similarly, in most cultures, the idea of immersion and going through water, uh, we have it in baptism, is a, is a great um, symbol of transformation and inner transformation. So something more important is being said than some freak of nature. Uh, that, um, and furthermore, why, why is this myth important? Because every year in ritual, uh, it's brought alive at Passover with the Jewish Seder. And the Seder tells you that every Jew 
must consider that he is a member of that generation that escaped from Egypt. It's timeless. It's brought into the life and heart of every Jew, and it becomes a living reality. And this is religion. This is, this is what religion is, is trying to do. Now, the most important thing about myth, however, um, is that myth is essentially a program for action. Uh, it's a program for action. You, you, the, myth can, the story, the myth, can place you in the right, correct spiritual posture, but it's up to you to take the next step. It's up to you to take part in a mindful way in that ritual. Just as it's uh, up to you as a Christian to take part uh, in, in the ritual of Christ's, of, of the Eucharist and experience the presence of Christ within you. Uh, the, the, often, myths were always either reenacted as it, as symbolically as in the Seder or, or in the communion service or literally reenacted in the ancient world in great dramatic festivals. And these dramas would uh, bring the inner meaning, just like any great theatrical performance, would bring the inner meaning of this story right into the heart of the, uh, the, 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 the participants, those who took part. People who took part in the Eleusinian mysteries in Athens were really rigorous ritual lasting several days, really taxing, frightening, came out of them often feeling that they no longer were afraid of death. Uh, this had a, these rituals have a profound effect. Also, uh, later, uh, one put them into practice in an ethical way. But the point is that unless you uh, do perform these rituals, turn them into these myths, turn them into uh, an action and bring them alive in your own life, they remain opaque. So our peculiar belief in the modern period, and it is peculiar, uh, I mean, in, this, in the original sense of being one, on, one of a kind, one of its own, is that we first have to believe a whole lot of myths, and then we decide whether we're going to live a, uh, a good religious life, would be regarded as, as pretty nonsensical um, by people such as the Buddha. Um, you, first you do, then you get it. Now, in the modern period, we've turned uh, knowledge into very much a, a sort of head trip. Um, it's, it's a, you believe things, there are these doctrines, and I'm coming to that, uh, all that in a moment. But religion is actually, a f religious knowledge is actually a form of practical knowledge, like driving or swimming. Uh, you can't learn to swim by reading a book and sitting on the side of the pool. You have to get in, immerse yourself into the element and learn how to float. And once you've mastered that, you can't imagine why you ever found it difficult at all. You've just got a knack. Uh, but you have to do it. And no amount of explaining it or telling you how to manipulate your limbs will, will can, can substitute for doing it. Similarly, driving. You can't learn to drive simply by uh, reading the highway code or, um, the, or, or the car manual. You have to learn to get in and manipulate the brakes until you, it, it's second nature and you can't really explain to anyone laboriously how you do it. Um, a dancer or a gymnast has to practice for years, for years, uh, ev all day and every day until um, they learn to move with an unearthly grace and perform feats that are absolutely impossible for an untrained body. Now, religious people have found through the centuries that certain rituals, uh, ritualizing these myths which explain what is going on in the psyche, in your mind, in your heart, and lift you up to transcendence, they find, and also certain ethical uh, practices, one of the kingpin of those is compassion, is that if you practice these assiduously, you, like a dancer, acquire new capacities 
but new capacities of heart and mind that are incomprehensible to an untrained person. Now, what happened? How did we get to this state that we've, as it were, put the cart before the horse? Uh, well, uh, the word belief has become central to the religious experience, we, so much so that we actually call uh, religious people believers, as though accepting certain doctrines of, in the creed were the most important thing that they ever did. Um, but the word belief has changed its meaning. Um, in, uh, it, me it means believer in uh, Middle English, right up to the 17th, and right up to the 17th century, it meant to trust, co to commit yourself. Uh, loyalty. Accept my believer, said Chaucer's knight to his lady. Accept my loyalty, my fealty. Um, and so when they were translating the Bible into English, uh, the King James and uh, other uh, translators and other uh, translators found this Greek word in the New Testament, pistis. And that means to commit yourself, um, to trust. And so they translated it believer. Now, in, when St. Jerome was translating pistis into Latin, um, he, he used the word fides, which means faith, loyalty, commitment. But there wasn't a verbal form for pistis, for for, 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 for fides. So he used the word credo, uh, now translated, I believe, but uh, originally it meant, um, I give you, cordo, I give you my heart, I give my heart to this. Um, so when Jesus is asking for belief or faith, we assume that he's asking that we believe that he's the second person of the Trinity, an idea he'd have found rather strange. Um, but um, in fact, Jesus is not asking for this at all. He's asking people to commit themselves. He is asking for people to live rough, uh, to live, uh, with, sleep rough with, you know, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, to live like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, trusting, having pistis in God their Father, to give all their possessions to the poor, and to work night and day for the coming of the kingdom when rich and poor will sit at the same table. And that regards commitment and hard work. Um, and early in the, how this would work in ritual, we know that um, this very early baptismal ceremonies were very elaborate affairs and for adults only. I mean, the, the ancients thought that it, religion was a serious matter and not really for children. So um, the, the, new, um, the new Christians would wait outside the church. They, it, Midnight, they'd been preparing for this all during Lent. On Easter Sunday, they would be baptized. And all the six weeks, they'd been intensively preparing for this moment and a very dramatic ritual. Um, and they would go into the church, they would be stripped of their clothes, and they would then be immersed in the baptismal pool. It's just going through their own Red Sea, their own immersion. And they're, they're thinking very much of the people of Israel uh, going through uh, that that um, that, that uh, purification, that that moment of creation. This is a new creation to have cast off their old selves, and they are plunged down underneath the pool, and the officiant will say, "Do you have pistis or fides in God the Father?" And they would come up spluttering, crying, "Pisteo, I commit myself." Um, in the sun, pisteo, credo. Now, these people were not sitting on the edge of the pool thinking, saying, well, having weighed all the evidence, I can now uh, affirm that there is a God and that I'm ready to go. Not at all. This was an act of absolute commitment at a time when it could be very dangerous to be a Christian. 
Um, and, it was, and the rituals uh, changed them, and it was only after that that they were introduced to some of the more difficult uh, articles of faith, such as Trinity. Now, um, what happened in the early modern period uh, was that, that the word belief started to change its meaning to mean a, an intellectual assent to a somewhat dubious proposition. Um, and we first find it used by Newton, uh, one of the first usages. He said when he devised his solar system that he had it in mind that it might work with considering men for belief in a deity. Newton believed, and really believed, that he had found um, in this in intricate solar system an absolute proof for God's existence because it was so intricate that it must have uh, had an intelligent mind to start the whole thing off. God was absolutely central to Newton's physics. Um, and um, he said, it's now clear, we can now prove what it says in the Bible, that there really is an all-intelligent being that is uh, wise, and good, it must be good because it's preserving us all, and, he said, clearly very well versed in mechanics and geometry. <laughs> now, what you're doing here, I mean, this kind of thing would have absolutely made people like Thomas Aquinas uh, turn in his grave. Uh, or or the, 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 the great early Greek father, fathers of the Greek church said it, the the, un, the, uh, the world, physical world, can tell us nothing about God. Nothing about God, because God uh, is um, being itself and can have nothing in common with the world which is created from nothing, whose, being, whose essential being is nothingness. Um, but, um, and uh, Newton's uh, theory was soon uh, disproved. Um, and, and within two or three generations, scientists like, such as Laplace were saying that um, actually you don't need that hypothesis. You can imagine this coming about of its own accord. Now, none of this would have mattered much um, if the churches, as well as the Enlightenment philosophers, hadn't taken up Newton's God and uh, felt that they could, really could prove God's existence. I haven't time to go into Thomas Aquinas's proofs for the existence of God. They're not proofs. They, they're a form of the Bromogia competition. At the end of them, he says, we don't know what it is we've proved. All we've proved is the existence of a mystery. Um, uh, it, it pushing you into a state of transcendence. Um, and, but we got so hooked on this, what we call natural theology, that we lost the old habits of mind and heart, what I call the apophatic, the silent, which when you're reduced to silence. Um, and so when Darwin came along, uh, we were left without recourse and people were floundering. And as globalization has spread, our, this kind of thinking has spread to other parts of the world, and so you get Muslims and even Jews and Buddhists even beginning to think in these uh, sort of literalistic terms about their faith. Now, so uh, religion is a form of practical action. And what is it most that they are ask, that they, what they all ask us to do is compassion. This is the meaning of the doctrine of Trinity, for example. Trinity was revealed to those catechumens after their baptism, the, after they'd been introduced, after they'd had this extraordinary experience of ritual. Um, and it, but Trinity wasn't just, they didn't just say, I've got news for you, God is one and one is, and God is three. Uh, they, it was a meditation. It was a meditation which, in, rather like the uh, Buddhist mandala, where you... Uh, thought of the absolutely unknowable essence of God, and then you swung your mind back to the uh, three uh, manifestations of God to the world, uh, and then back to the unknowable again, to remind you that you couldn't think about God as a simple personality. And if, but if you don't do the meditation, you don't get it. 
any more than you, you know those uh, mathematical uh, problems we learnt at school where you go through a whole line of reasoning and at the end you come out, so A equals B X squared, uh, a formula which is nonsense because if you haven't gone through the reasoning before. One of the reasons why we've always found Trinity difficult in the West is that we didn't do the meditation. Um, and Trinity is all about, too, uh, about letting go of the self. The, the, the Trinity, as, as, as it's depicted often in uh, a Russian iconography, shows the three, three angels that appeared to Abraham. And if you look at them, uh, there's a very famous one by Andrei Rublev, and each one represents one of the Trinity. And you're, you are, uh, you're, they're sitting around a table, and you're sitting opposite them, and you, your eye is drawn to the central figure that, uh, which represents the word, the second person. But he doesn't look at you. He's looking to the left at the one representing the spirit who also doesn't return his gaze but looks over to the one on the far right, which is the father, circling round. But this isn't a god that is looking, taking you on head on. Each empties itself and passes on to the other. Because what uh, that, that, that myth is telling us is that holding on to ourselves and our egos and our selfishness and demand and at all costs is what holds us back from the divine. And the safest way to get rid of ego is through compassion, where you dethrone yourself from the center of your world and put another there. And that is why every single one of the major world religions uh, has put compassion right at the heart of its teaching and says that this is the test of true faith. Um, my favorite... Uh, golden rule story is probably refers to the great Pharisee Hillel, who uh, was once approached by a pagan who promised to convert to Judaism on condition that the rabbi could recite the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. And Hillel replied simply, that which is hateful to you, do not to your fellow man. That is Torah, and everything else is only commentary. Go and study it. Everything else is only commentary. No mention of the unity of God, the creation of the world, uh, the exodus from Egypt. That's a commentary on the golden rule, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. Confucius, the first person that I know to formulate the golden rule, said that it was a central thread that ran through all his teaching and that pulled it all together. Um, and he, he said to his disciples, you must practice it all day and every day. Not just when you feel like it. Not when you are, um, uh, you, you know, how we, uh, well, perhaps you don't do this in Canada, but we have a habit in the UK of when we've done something nice for someone of saying, well, that's my good deed for the day. Um, as though we can now return to the next 23 hours to our usual bitterness, greed, and selfishness. Uh, no, all day and every day. To, to do what the golden rule says, you look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. All day and every day. It means all day and every day you're stepping outside the ego and putting yourself in the place of another. And that, says, says the Confucian scripture analects, is what brings you into transcendence. Because it, the Greeks had a word for this. They called it ecstasy, uh, which means stepping outside. You're standing outside the self. And it is that that brings us into relation to transcendence, when we lay aside the greedy, grasping ego. Um, and um, I think it's important to note that and here I come full circle to when I was saying that before, in, in, in the pre-modern period, uh, all ideology was in some way religious. religious per religion permeated everything. And so these uh, great um, 
uh, thinkers and sages, and I'm talking about the Buddha, Confucius, Jesus, uh, uh, the rabbis, uh, the prophets, uh, the sages of the Upanishads, uh, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They were all w uh, working in societies like our own, where violence had reached an unprecedented crescendo. And they were looking into an abyss. Of course, that violence was uh, minuscule compared with what we face today. But um, they uh, were convinced that if we went on uh, behaving in this inimical way to us, each other, we would destroy ourselves. And they all insisted you couldn't confine your benevolence to your own group. You had to give it even to your enemies. Nothing to do with feeling, nothing to do with feeling love for your enemies, but putting uh, that, uh, making sure that you were out for his good looking out for his well-being, that you would be loyal to him and come to his aid. And this is the sort of love that we must give to our enemies. And uh, they were not, but, but they were quite political in their thinking. In China, uh, the Confucians be would become um, major advisors to the emperor. And what they were trying to do was counterbalance the emperor and his armies and warfare uh, with all the apparatus of the state with this ethic of compassion. Uh, they're offering an alternative. The Buddha did the same at a time when India was reaching a, a, a sort of height of aggression and commercial, uh, a new commercial life was dawning and greed was taking over. Uh, he was offering another way of being human, based on compassion and kindness and respect. King, one, one of the kings came to visit him one day to the, and looked at the way the monks were looking at each other. He said, with eyes as gentle as wild deer. And this is another way to be human. Uh, uh, and Jesus, you, are, you see Jesus in the gospel standing before the Roman governor. Uh, standing before the Roman governor, talking about another kind of kingdom, another kind of way for human beings to live together rather than one based on power. And Christ crucified becomes an emblem of all the horror, the cruelty, the violence that men inflict upon other men and women, women too. Uh, 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 the ecce homo uh, is, is that famous, uh, often painted uh, depiction of Jesus with the crown of thorns and suffering. That is the human being, suffering at the hands of other human beings. Um, and similarly, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was operating at a time in Mecca when vile and, and Arabia when violence had reached an unprecedented crescendo. And the Quran is a call for compassion, a call not for sort of touchy, feely compassion, but that, that you look after the poor, you devote your life to creating a just and decent society where all people, even the most vulnerable, are treated with respect. This is what we are called to do. Um, it is a struggle, it's an effort. But in doing this, we leave the grasping, greedy, insecure, frightened ego behind. And we encounter a transcendence uh, that we call God, uh, or Brahman, or Tao, or Nirvana. And it's a long road, uh, but it is, it, is, it, it is, I think, lies at the, at the heart of a great deal of some of the best of the religious aspirations uh, in all of the world traditions. Thank you. <laughs>